Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me all right? Just let me uh, follow up uh, Andrew's pres presentation by telling you a little bit about who I am and what, and what I do um, and who I do it for. Uh, I was for eight years uh, the managing partner of a law firm in the United Kingdom, um, so I am by background a lawyer. And that firm doubled in size in the first four years of, uh, while I was managing partner, and then it doubled in size again. And that brought about quite a lot of problems of decision making. The firm had grown. There were people who didn't remember the history and the traditions. And decision making became quite an uncomfortable process. It wasn't a one-man show. It was a true partnership. And therefore, I found over the course of time different points uh, during the growth of the firm when I had to make decisions or help the firm make decisions in a different way. And then in 2000, at the end of 2001, I uh, moved out of that into the uh, consultancy world where I've been mainly helping, uh, well, helping professional service firms and mainly law firms. 80% of my uh, clients have been law firms. Uh, and uh, most of those, most of my work is outside the United Kingdom now. I do some work in the United Kingdom, but most of my work is in uh, places, uh, Asia, the Middle East, and so on. And j just to give you uh, a flavor of the sort of things we're going to do, talk about, I'm going to talk about this afternoon, I'm going to break it into three chapters, if you will. The first one is, how does the model of how you run yourself, how you manage yourself, change as your firm grows? And then the second uh, area is how you get decision making right. And then the third, year, third uh, area is that even if you're not a partnership as such, how do you harness the power of the partnership model in your firm? And before I start on that, let me give you a couple of examples uh, of work that I've been doing recently at two different ends of the extreme. The first end is with a sole practitioner lawyer in the Middle East who wants to build an enduring institution. Now he could have said, uh, I'm comfortable, I'm doing well, I'm happy as I am, and that would be a perfectly sensible choice. But instead he said, no, I can see more. I think we could build a bigger presence here. We could do more things. We could get more interesting work from all sorts of different parts of the world. And therefore I want to grow. I've got some people in my organization that I'd like to bring into partnership, and I've got some people that I've spotted uh, outside my firm who uh, I would like to uh, bring into the firm. And so what I've been helping him do is to build, if you like, from a blank sheet of paper, the infrastructure uh, that will help the firm govern itself and manage itself uh, more properly. So if there are any of you with, uh, that are in quite small firms here, there are some things here that I hope will be useful to you. The other extreme is uh, one that's currently, um, frankly, keeping me awake a bit at night because it's a 50-partner uh, a uh, partnership in North America. It's not actually a law firm, and they're frankly not getting on. There are about 14 different silos or cliques within the firm. They all feel slightly different ways. People don't turn up to meetings, and then when a decision is made, they try to undermine the decision because they say, well, I wasn't there, I don't agree with that. And so the thing has to go back to square one and start all over again. And I'm trying to help them build a better and more efficient and effective uh, governance structure. And of course, there are many examples in between. Those are two examples of the sort of work that I'm, I'm doing at the moment. What I want to do first up, if you will, is to uh, look at a few concepts uh, and it was, I found it very helpful when, when I, um, ooh, it must have been 20 years ago, when somebody introduced me to the, uh, the concept that a firm is just like a human being. You know, we're all born, uh, we all go through childhood in some cases, in mine a long, long time ago. We become adolescent, uh, we become mature, mature, and then eventually we start to age and, and then eventually we die. Uh, and the concept is that uh, a firm or a company is just the same as that. It goes through various passages. It's born. It goes through a phase of uh, go-go growth, and then it goes through adolescence and so on. 
And, and it may be that you will recognize uh, your firm in, in, in this. Many firms enter at the birth stage what's called a creative phase, and this is one where ever, there are no, really no systems, there's, there's no bureaucracy, everything is driven by fun and entrepreneurism. Um, and uh, people will uh, um, work hard and give every single hour they can to the firm. It's a creative phase, but that can't last forever. And then firms tend to go through what's called a consensus phase. I've got one firm that I've been dealing with, which is a 20-partner law firm, uh, and they have difficulties over decision-making because what they've said is we're a consensus-based firm. Everything's got to be dealt with by the partners. We're all owners. And therefore, once a month, they have a partners' meeting, and that partners' meeting tends to go on for ages because everything, you know, the colour of the carpets and everything upwards, comes in front of that group. Um, and uh, they... They have a managing partner, but he's really there to sort of preside over a facilitation process. He's not there to drive the business. Uh, they have committees. Uh, they, have, um, they have all sorts of things going on. They have a, a management team. But things happen very, very slowly. Then you've got a f uh, some firms who've moved beyond that. They recognize that actually, you can't carry on business that way. The firm has grown to a size, they will say, where we need uh, some professional management, where we need a committee. We need to delegate some of the functions that we do to a smaller body to get on with, while we, the partners, get back to what we're good at, be it law, be it accountancy, be it medicine, be whatever it is. And the firm starts to get run on sort of semi-commercial lines. Um, the partners remain very sensitive to some of the things that are important to them, holidays and money and things like that. Uh, and therefore, anything that's going to affect their own working lives is key to them. And you often see in uh, partnership agreements and membership agreements that, that there are certain things that a management committee or a board or a, or a chief executive or a managing partner can't do. That's got to come back for a vote, be it 60%, uh, 70%, uh, 90%, or even in some cases, unanimity vote to the partners. Uh, then the firm might get to a mature phase where the firm has more or less become a bit of an institution. It's like a well-rounded club where people understand the rules, there are systems, there are processes, uh, that there is um, a, a strong culture, a strong partnership ethos, and so on and so forth. And an example in the legal sector uh, that I sometimes give is Slaughter and May, who don't have a huge amount of bureaucracy, don't have a huge amount of, 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 of uh, management systems and so on, uh, but everyone knows how that works. Some firms never get to that stage. So there are, if you like, some examples of how firms can grow and go through different phases, and there are some typical transition points that I've noticed when firms go through that, and some danger points as well, which I will come to in a moment. Obviously, size and growth is the main thing. You know, if you're just one or two people, and you get to 200 people, things have to change. And therefore, I, and I tend to find in the work I do, that once you get to about 15 partners, it's very difficult to make decisions as a partnership. And, and firms often find that 15 to 20 partners is a phase when they have to make a change. Obviously, if there's a merger or an acquisition, then that changes things as well. Uh, significant changes in the leadership group. You find a new management team, a chairman or a managing partner gives up and there's a new one. It's a, it's a time for a change. One firm I'm dealing with have experienced a sudden drop in profitability. And that's caused all sorts of anxieties about the way the firm is managed, who manages it, what the systems are. And so that's a change too. Then there is a situation where you have maybe a founding partner or a group of very influential senior partners and they step back or retire and that's a change as well. And obviously we have onset of crisis and, and, and more offices and so on. All these are transition points. Back to my growth cycle, danger points now. And the first danger point is the found, what was called the founder trap and this is the the, the situation where there is a founder or a set of founders, then they won't let go. 
what's become a loving embrace becomes an iron grip. I've got one firm that's, done, that, that's going through that phase at the moment. The, the two, two uh, founding partners, one is the managing partner, and he spends most of his time doing law, um, and the result, and, but he won't let go of the management. And the result is that everything gets stifled. His desk begins to pile up with decisions that need to be made, and he won't make them because he hasn't got the time. He's, he's, he's focusing his life and his world uh, on the practice of law. Uh, and things get stifled. And if they're not sure, if they're not careful, that firm is going to fall into this trap and, 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 and will, will, will enter a sort of premature aging situation. And the, the, an issue is whether or not founders start to, or even have, introduce people to the firm who aren't a challenge to them. I've had many, many firms who, who when they come to the, if you like, the next generation of partners, then they're sort of, if you like, grey B people. Because the alpha male or the alpha female didn't want another alpha male, so they appointed other people who weren't quite as good or quite as strong. And that becomes an issue for the founder firm. The second uh, 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 danger point is the leadership vacuum. I mean, this is when, when partners realize that they've got to give up some of their autonomy, some of their independences, uh, but they, there's nobody whom they trust. Uh, they might appoint a chief executive or a managing partner, partner in external management. Are they going to give them any authority? No. Uh, they're not going to allow anybody to create any rules over them. After all, they're partners. And again, decision making can be slow. And then you have the premature aging firms, the firms that are just focused on the short term, this year's profit. Uh, um, and, and there's a reluctant to invest with as, as, as partners get uh, close to retirement. There's one firm I'm dealing with where there are five partners who are going to retire within the next five years. And they're refusing to let the firm make any financial decision unless there's a return on the investment during the next five years. They're saying, why should we invest in this? We're not going to see the benefit of it. They're holding the firm up. And then the fourth danger point is uh, one that uh, firms often struggle with, which is that they respond to their growth model by saying, we've got to have some rules. This is the way that we'll write a partner performance management system. We'll have uh, accountabilities and disciplines and targets and budgets and business plans and, and all the rest of it. And all those can have very good and powerful uh, things going for them, but uh, it can get stultified if you're not careful. So uh, just a word, if you like, on style and culture at this stage, because the way in which these issues can be approached will depend very much on your sort of outlook in, in life. Um, and, and indeed, the firm I'm dealing with in North America at the moment embodies all of these standpoints in their firm. You have some people who are on the, very much on the, on, the, uh, on, on, the, on the right side of the screen and saying, the way to run this firm is control. These people need to understand who's boss. They're not working hard enough. They need to be driven. Uh, we need a very tight central body that's going to run everything and tell them what to do. Um, uh, uh, and so they would come from that end. There are equally some other people at the other end which say, no, 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 we need a light touch to this. We're all professionals. We're all highly intelligent people. We're all motivated by the desire for quality and excellence. Uh, and you don't need much by way of disciplines and so on. You just need to sort of point us in the right direction and see you at 60. And those firms tend to regard management as an interference, and they tend to hate bureaucracy. And then in the middle, there is a sort of current mixture of two. You've got, uh, if you like, the, the decentralized hand, where, where um, there is a centralized executive group, and it opera operates on a consultative consensus model. Most firms, international firms, will fall into that sort of area. And I think there is a philosophical point here that firms need to think about. In our partner dealings, in our dealings with each other, which do we instinctively head for? Do we feel that we need more control or less control? What's the sort of middle ground for us? And it's an important point to get right at some stage. 
that brings me on to some of the things that I see uh, happening in law firms that, that, uh, that impede decision making. Um, and um, I, I, I sort of developed this list over time. It started off with about 10, um, um, uh, 10 things in it, in it that, that I noticed in firms. But, but as, as I've worked through firms, I've found more. And I've now got up to about 20. They're not necessarily the only ones. And the first point that I would make clear is uh, ineffective strategy. Now, again, this sort of tends to go back to the philosophy on the, on the first slide. And what the voice of the firm is. I often find that there is not agreement in the firm about things like internationalization, whether the firm should be commercial or private sector, whether the firm should focus on one business area or another, whether it should be niche, whether it should uh, be geographically spread or just locally based. All those things are things that people have different views about within the firm. And one of the things that I uh, like to do with firms is say, let's get this right. Let's just understand what sort of firm you are, what your identity is, why on earth are you all in business together other than to make money. I mean, the pursuit of money is good, but it's not the only thing. And, and also what your vision is for the future. And that, when I talk about vision, I don't like talking about some airy fairy sort of castle in the sky. What I talk about is something that you're prepared to invest in. How f what's your appetite for risk? How far you're prepared to borrow money to, if, if that's what you have to do, in order to see the firm progress? How far you are um, g uh, going to allow your individual independences and autonomies to be uh, whittled away at? All that's important. Um, and if you can get those things right, it doesn't half help. I, I also see, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, ineffective uh, decision-making processes, all very ad hoc. Um, and I've got an example at the moment where one firm is complaining because they're trying to be, they're being, they feel they're being bounced into a decision by the executive group. Uh, they haven't seen many papers. They see um, uh, a, an agenda the day before a partner's agreement. There is insufficient thought being given to the return on investment. There isn't a proper business case. There has been no process. Uh, the partners are not able to, if you ask them what the process is for making decisions, there isn't one. Whereas you go to other firms and say, yeah, if around here, if we want to make a decision, this is how we go about it. These are the people we've got to consult with. These are the, this is the way the paperwork's got to go. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, if you like, the decision tree that we follow. Uh, and some of that's the result of inexperienced leadership. Um, uh, but even when you've got good leaders, you sometimes have partners say, well, we may have decent leaders, but I, I don't have trust in them. Uh, well, one management guru, a guy called David Meister, uh, worked for many, many years in professional service firm arenas. And, uh, and he ended up saying, well, I used to say all professional service firms are the f same. But I've come to the conclusion that's not right. Lawyers are different. And lawyers are different because of the lack of trust that they have. <laughs> instinctively cautious, instinctively sceptical. I'm not sure I agree with him, because I've come across loads of other professional firms where the issue of trust has been a real one. But it is a real problem. So, so I'm not going to go through the whole list um, uh, of these, because uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll have access to the slides. Um, are they going to get sent? Yeah, the slides are going to be up somewhere. So, so you'll see that, but I just thought it was a helpful list. Work through it yourself if, if these things are important to you and see where it is that you fall down, if at all. Now, if you can say, no, 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 we can put great big green ticks against all of that, then, then fine. I haven't found a firm yet that's, uh, that, that's able to do that, apart from a one-man practice. So, so please uh, come to me and, and let me know if you, if, if you think you've got the perfect firm. Just a word, if I may, about the role of the top management group. Um, and, and here, for, you'll notice I haven't really uh, defined this, uh, but it could be a board. It could be a group of two. It could be the chief executive and the, and the chair of the firm, or it could be a, a management committee. And I think I see them as having four essential roles uh, in, in a firm that are promoting, sponsoring, coordinating, and motivating. Now, they don't have to do have all the work. They should be doing some things where actually what their role is to facilitate and to promote a project, to have the idea, say, we need to do this. 
we need to improve these premises, we need to change the compensation uh, system, whatever it may be, and to start the thing off. Uh, the, the next role is the sponsorship role, where they are the ones that are providing resources for an essential project to go forward. And then there's the coordination role, which I found very interesting when I was a managing partner, because you tend to find uh, that one department doesn't know what another's doing, one office doesn't know what another's doing, even one uh, management professional doesn't know what the others are doing. And that role of making sure that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing is, is a vital one. And then the final one is, this, if you like, the leadership role. The, the role of making sure that everyone is enthused, is passionate, um, is, uh, is, is focused on committing and committed to whatever the strategic goals are. And I think it's helpful if, if you can get that idea in your mind in, in conceptual terms. It's not the role, as I see it, of the management committee to do all the management and hold it like this. It's the role of the management committee to make sure that the firm uh, is properly communicated with and, and have all these good things. So let's move, if you will, uh, to uh, look at the second area, which is getting decision-making right in the firm. Uh, and uh, I start off, if you will, with a, with a slightly flippant uh, slide, which is, um, the, if you like, the Pareto principle, which you come across, no doubt, whereby you can get 80% uh, of the result by doing 20% of the work. I've always liked that one. Um, and, and the Pareto principle for decision-making in a firm uh, does help. And the, and the first principle is not, a, not very many decisions are actually life-threatening. A lot of the decisions that a law firm make, or a firm, any firm makes, are ones that are made on a balance of probabilities, and are, uh, life or death does not follow uh, as a result of getting it wrong. Some decisions are very important, and there are a lot of firms that are run into trouble with pre-recession premises decisions or, or, or what have you not. But the point about this is to make sure that you understand what's the effect of this decision going to be in the long run. Is it a vital one, uh, is it, is, or is it not? The, r the second rule is that a lot of decisions are made by default. If you think of strategy for a moment, if you do nothing about your strategy, what happens is the status quo continues on. It's a default decision. If you do nothing about, say, your IT system, that is a default decision to carry on with the old one. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's good to say, why do we need to make a decision about this? What's the worst that can happen if we don't make any decision? Uh, and you're not, I'm not suggesting for a moment make no decisions, but do just question uh, the need for some of the projects that you might get in front of you. Rule three is the Pareto rule that for a lot of things you can uh, gather 80% of the data and make 80% of the analysis in the first 20% of time available and make the decision provisionally, if you will, uh, on, the, on that basis. There are, uh, this is particularly, I think, the case with lawyers. Lawyers tend to want everything extra. They won't make a decision until they've got all the facts, all the data. And you go to a meeting and say, let's make a decision to do this. And they say, oh, we want some more analysis, please. And you get paralysis by analysis. And what I'm suggesting is that actually at some stage you can stand back and say, well, um, on the basis of 80%, we can probably form a decision on this basis. Now, rule number four is be quick to change your mind if something isn't working. Uh, I've, I've seen so many firms where they, where they decide to do something, it doesn't work, and they keep going. I mean, take, take so opening another office, for example, and it doesn't work. Pull out quickly. Be decisive. Be bold. But when something's working well, pile in on that uh, and, and, uh, uh, and maximize on it. Then I've got the, uh, what's called the RASKIP, and this is a way of clarifying decision-making rights for uh, particularly firms as they get bigger. And how this works is, um, generally what I see is, is you get, a, uh, you get a, a managing partner 
uh, who may have a job description in, in the best cases. And the job description may say, this is his authority. He can spend up to $50,000 and he can do this, that and the other. And you may even have some roles and responsibilities of a management board or executive committee. Um, and, so, and, 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 and the, you may also have, if you like, the reserve matters, those things that need to come back to the whole partnership for approval. And there it ends. And I think that's, uh, and what I'm suggesting is that there, there may be more to it than that. Now, the RASKIT model is that you need to work out who's got the actual responsibility for delivering a project. Now, this is really important because you can decide in concept terms we're going to do something. And then uh, I find professional firms as a whole are littered with half-finished half initiatives and uh, projects that are sort of run into the desk, uh, run into the, into the dirt. And I think you need to have somebody on every management project who is accountable for that project, or as a group, maybe. So responsibility is one of the things you have to decide in relation to, to projects. Uh, who do you need approval from? Do we need it from the whole partnership? Do we need it from this office or that practice group? Do we need it just from the executive committee or the managing partner? Clarify that. Who's going to be supportive in making this happen? Is it need support from the know-how people, the IT people, the finance people? Who, who's going to support it? Now, an important point is consultation. It may be that the, the approval process requires the thing to come back to the whole partnership for approval, but who's going to get consulted with along the way? Because the last thing that works is for somebody to come to a partners meeting with a 50-page report which clatters on people's desk or via their email the day before the meeting and the, and the chairman of the group says, right, we've, you've seen the paper, um, hands up who's for this. Because people generally won't buy that. Um, but if they've been part of it, if they've been consulted, then that helps. And then the final ones, who's, in, who's informing uh, and who's promoting. Informing is those who sometimes need to be told you know, name change. You, you, the more junior people in the firm might get told after the fact. And then promotion, who is responsible? Who's responsible for promoting or, or, or coming up with the idea? Now, you can table this. Um, and here's an illustration of, of how this might get tabled. It's a, it's a simple table. And you have um, across the top uh, the firm, equity partners, um, full partners meeting, executive committee, the various people that you have in it. And then you have the examples of various decision, decisions that the firm might need to make. And you simply work through the table with who's got the responsibility, who's got the approval, uh, the approval process, and the consultation, uh, and so on. It's just a useful way of focusing people's mind exactly who's going to do what. We don't want surprises around here. We want transparency. But we do want firm management. We do want to be consulted in various areas. So typical steps in a RASKIP process is to, first of all, identify, you know, work through the table, all the, all the activities, identify the roles, complete the cells, and, and so on. And there's a helpful step-by-step -step analysis of, of, of how to do that. So that's RASKIP. Not everybody likes it. Some people find it very bureaucratic. And I'm not sort of preaching that it's, it's there for everybody. But in certain, type, certain firms, or with certain types of project, it's very useful to have that at the front, if you like, of the project book. Who's going to do what on this? So I want to spend the final few minutes talking about the partnership model and how to harness the power of it. And, and, and I want to look at five uh, different steps. And these aren't necessarily sequential. Uh, they're all things that you can do. Uh, because I'm, this is, if you like, how to bring some of the concepts uh, that I've talked about in, into play. Uh, the first thing is to understand the characteristics of professional service. Now, uh, I'm indebted here to a book um, put out by Copenhagen Business School Press. Uh, and to some extent, this is, if you like, the start of what I see a fight, as a fight back, particularly in the legal profession, against the prophets of gloom who say that everything um, is commoditizing. There is no role for brain power anymore. And I just don't happen to think that that's right. Because what it's, I mean, it's right in some contexts, 
Um, and some of our services will get commoditized and packaged uh, and processed and dealt with that way. And I'm talking about here the aspects of professional practice, whether you're an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, or whoever, uh, that relies upon the thing between your two ears. And the first point to make is that these things are, are not very tangible. Wisdom is not tangible. Experience and know-how is not particularly tangible. It's very difficult to measure it. And some of these things can be quite idiosyncratic, and some of the things require us to innovate, not in terms of creating new products and services every five minutes, but in to be, uh, think laterally in the way that we solve our clients' problems for them. Uh, and uh, th this boils down into uh, five areas that it, the, the work we do at best, and that I think professional service firms do best to consider, is the work that is highly knowledge intensive, highly specialised, where there is a high degree of personal judgement involved, where it, there is professional qualities and norms to going on, uh, and where there is substantial interaction with our clients. Now, if we can stick to in our law firms, in our professional firms, in our accountancy firms, in our medical practices, to those areas, if that becomes one of the tests, not so much what we're going to make money out of, uh, but how are we going to use our intellectual brain power, then I think some of the law firms that I've known and some of the other professional firms will become uh, 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 better places. And therefore, I'm, not, I'm offering this as a diagnostic. When you're looking at a new service or one of your existing services, putting it through this test, does it fulfill these things? Now, if it doesn't, if it is a pure commodity, that's, I'm not saying junk it, but I'm saying recognize it for what it is and come up with a business model that delivers that in the best way, which may not be partners. I see so many partners of professional firms getting frustrated because the work they do um, has become boring and repetitious and, and process orientated. Um, and, and many professionals don't want to be uh, in charge of a factory process. Some do, uh, but ma many, many find a bigger appeal from this. And this, uh, I think, leads me on to the different character types uh, within many firms. Uh, and this is just a model that I've used from time to time but, uh, because I've seen so many people falling into this category or these categories. In this box up here, we've got what I've called the performaholics. And you'll notice that uh, I've got two uh, dimensions on this matrix, uh, the achievement orientation and the altruism orientation. Now, the performaholics in a firm are those who say, we're after profit, we're after results. We want to drive this firm forward we want to be, you know, reach this type, type of profit. We want to achieve these type of targets. They're not particularly focused on doing good. They're there as business people. This is a business more than a profession. Down in this corner, we've got the lifestylists who say, no, 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 no. I'm a lawyer and accountant because I can't think of anything better to do. Um, and, and, you know, I make good money out of it. Uh, but what I'm there for, I'm, what my big interest in life is sailing my yacht or shooting or my family. Um, and really what I'm after is uh, just enough work to make me earn just enough profit to be able to um, have good holidays and, and, and to indulge my lifestyle. Now, at this end of the spectrum, I'm, I'm not thinking too much about others. Uh, and if, you know, if I'm right down here, then I'm probably going to be out of my firm because I'm lazy and uncommitted and I'm not results orientated and so on and so forth. Over here, we've got the idealists who say, no, 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 no. What we're about in our professional service firm is the public good, doing better for society. Or in the case of law, peddling pure law. What really gets me off is uh, lots of big cases where uh, lots of technical points and I'm not really concerned, and these are the people who, when you look at their work in progress at the end of a period, they've racked up huge amounts of time on something that's of no value to the client or no interest to the client. They haven't thought about that. They're just thinking about the interest of the, of, of the technical point. 
they're idealists. They're, they're very altruism-oriented because they're thinking about the better good of society, uh, the better advancement of legal processes or accountancy or medicine. But they're not thinking about the firm as, uh, as, as, a, uh, as a business. And up here we've got, if you like, the ideal combination, which is the institution builders. These are people who are driven. Yep, we're performance orientated. Uh, we're doing stuff. We've got a good work ethic. Uh, give us a target and we'll do it. Give us a project, we'll complete it. Put us on the management committee and we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, and, and yet, they're also saying, yep, what turns me on is building my team. What turns me on is developing a, a, a national name. What turns me on is an enduring institution. And therefore I have the public good and the, and the firm's good in mind just as much as profit. Now the problem becomes that when you actually map people in a f typical firm, you've got people all over the place. You've got some performaholics, hopefully not too many sort of at the bottom end of lifestyleists. You've got some sort of uncommercial technical thinkers and you've got a few institution builders and then firms say to me yeah well that's all right we're a broad tent uh, we can we, we can cater for most types in our firm but it doesn't half help if you're all much the same thinking now why is this important for a, a building a good partnership it's important because you need to have some common ground you need to have a uh, if not a single aim, a unified aim as to what this firm is about. Because if you can do that, then if you like how you structure yourself, whether you're a partnership or a limited company or an LLP, whether you have a managing partner or a chief executive or a chief operating officer and so on, becomes less important because you all have one particular goal in mind. The other thing to do when thinking about a partnership is to, th is to think about who do we need to get on side round here? And the way this matrix, called an impact influence matrix, is quite a helpful way of looking at it, is, is let's have a look at the potential impact of change in our firm, and let's have a look at the influence of the people who uh, are involved in this. So in this top right-hand uh, corner here, we've got a change that is going to have a huge impact, and it's going to have a lot of impact on people with influence. So you need to get those people really bought in. Irrespective of whether on any management committee or otherwise, they need to understand and engage with your change, with your, your project. At this end, uh, if, it's, uh, if, if the people, the impact of change is not very high and the, and the influence of the stakeholders is not very great, then you're just going to keep people informed. Uh, and I've dotted around here the various types of meeting, a stakeholder, uh, and so on, who might be in a firm or where they might sit on quite a lot of the decision making uh, within that firm. And this is based upon a law firm. So again, if you're thinking about a change, if you're thinking about a change of governance, if you're thinking about a big project, work out where people sit on that and that will help you to learn uh, uh, who, who, uh, who you need to, who, who you need to whose influence you need to build in. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is what I call the four C's of accountability because I've, I've, over the last uh, 12 years or so that I've been doing this sort of work and before that when I was a managing partner, uh, people would say to me, oh, partners need to be accountable. There's no accountability around here. There's no discipline. Um, and, and in order to establish an accountable environment, um, I've got four rules that, that, if you like, they're fair rules. First of all, you've got to be consistent about the rules. You've got to have some uh, consistency between partners and non-partners, between uh, uh, and, and accountability, between professionals and non-professionals. That we're aiming for a firm that is still collegial and not one which is just a, a, a coal mine or a factory. Uh, we're aiming for the rules to be clear uh, and we're also aiming for one where the leadership and the management of the firm are together in a sort of unifying coalition that's going to drive the firm forward. This is not and can never be in a medium size or larger firm a one-man show. There has got to be a coalition. Uh, so those are four C's of accountability that um, 
is again something you ought to aim for when, when establishing an, encounting, uh, an, account, uh, uh, an environment for accountability. And then how do you, uh, finally, how do you gain support? Um, and here's a table I pinched from somewhere, I can't even remember where it, where it came from now, which shows the different types of people that, that may be in a firm. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you've got those who uh, will deliberately try and subvert the process. They will use every political games to undermine it. You've got those who are a bit more honest and actually say, I'm opposed to this. Over my dead body will this happen. At least you know where you stand with them. And then you've got the, uh, the majority of partners who are just so immersed in work, they really haven't thought about it very much. You've got people who are sympathetic, uh, but will make, make no effort. And then the ones you want around here are uh, those who are prepared to support or those who sh to share in the, the task, be that general management or in a certain project. And my solutions to this, well, first of all, in your firm, and it sort of sums up really all I'm saying, do make sure that you have got, if you will, a guiding coalition in your firm of the leadership. Uh, and, and, and I've been fond of saying that betwe as between a, uh, a senior partner or chairman and a managing partner or chief executive, uh, there shouldn't be a cigarette paper of difference between you. You should be that unified. And I think that's an important point. Early identification of who's going to be in opposing uh, your change is also vital because then you can make efforts to either isolate them or get them on side, making sure that you get the opinion formers on side and throughout this a topic if you like of another lecture and we haven't really got time to do it, the, the power of partnership workshops um, and Andrew thought, talked about the power of stories, the power of partnership workshops with stories involved is very good as well. So there's my, uh, there's my if you like, my uh, take on governance, there is no one size fits all. How one firm will rule itself is different from another. There are some guiding principles, which I hope I've elaborated, depending on the, where you are in terms of the growth and maturity of your firm, uh, and uh, there are some rules of accountability. So I hope that helps. Thank you very much. <laughs>